<laughs> John escaped from the Moonies last year and is now happily back home with his family. All thanks to Steve Hassan, a man who was once the cult's sworn enemy. He is considered the Antichrist. He is the arch enemy of cults uh, because he has discovered a lot of things. Hassan was a follower of Moon's controversial church for two and a half years until he left after an intervention in 1976. And when he heard about another cult tragedy, the 900 people who lost their lives in Jonestown, Guyana, he decided to try to save others by writing a book, Combating Cult Mind Control. It teaches families of cult members how to communicate with brainwashed loved ones. My whole approach is to ask questions and to prod reality testing and to try to provide information that allows an individual to make comparisons. That philosophy changed John Stacy's life forever. Steve's book helped me to break away from the Moonies. He had offered me plenty of information and support. Now John's family is supporting him as he re-enters the real world. He's only been home a couple of months. He's still not the same John that left uh, in 1992. But uh, it's like an egg that's cracking every day. I can see more and more of the old John shining through. John left his Mooney wife, but he says she keeps trying to suck him back into the cult and their marriage. He vows not to return. I feel like I'm really living uh, in the truth now, rather than living in somebody's uh, funky ideology. I'm still overwhelmed and overjoyed by the incredible news that 15-year-old Elizabeth Smart was found and that she's safe and back home with her family in Salt Lake City. But a lot of people want to know what really happened to that young girl. What did she experience? Did she try to escape? And was she really brainwashed by her alleged abductors? It's real. <laughs> it's real. God lives. He is there. He answers prayers and the prayers of the world that brought Elizabeth home. Elizabeth Smart, the 15-year-old girl that was abducted by Knife Point from her bedroom nine months ago, was miraculously found alive in Sandy, Utah, just 15 miles from her home. Elizabeth's incredible reunion with her family was joyous. But some have questioned why it appeared she hadn't tried to run away from her captors. If she had wanted to speak out, there were a number of people here, and people had gone up to ask her if she was okay. She even seemed reluctant to admit her identity to the police when questioned. She says, I, I know who you guys think I am, but I'm not that person. Why hadn't Elizabeth spoken out? Had she been brainwashed? Steve Hassan was a victim of brainwashing more than 26 years ago. He's the author who has written a book called Releasing the Bonds, and now he helps other victims of brainwashing, including Carrie. Now, Steve, thanks for being here today. I'm so glad you're doing this show, John. Well, I think it's so important, and you have helped so many people. My family rescued me, and I've spent the last 26 years helping others to get out. The, the key thing is that any intelligent, educated person under the right set of circumstances can be isolated, their identity can be disoriented, hypnosis, sleep deprivation, privacy deprivation, phobias put in their mind, members are taught thought stopping, and essentially a new identity is created, what as me as a mental health professional calls a dissociative disorder. So for example, we have the Elizabeth Smart, but now we have Augustine, who's now been programmed to believe Emmanuel is a, is a prophet of God, or Carrie was programmed to believe this guy was a prophet of God and you have no ability to be in touch with the resources you had growing up. And she's, she, I, I've got to say she was from a very loving family, wonderful people, religious, they're Mormons, and they have a deep religious ethic. And uh, she's and very... And Carrie came from an Orthodox Christian family, very loving. Right. I come from a Jewish family, very loving. Right. It really doesn't matter about the background. What, what matters is, is that social psychology, the use of, of indoctrination techniques are real and that the good news is that people want to be free, the human spirit wants love and truth, but it takes a very specialized kind of approach to get past the indoctrination to the real core self, get past the phobias, and get the person to start reality well, testing. What bothers it. me so much 
is, is the people in the media that are speculating, why didn't she try to get away? And I think Jody hit the nail on the head when he, here's a guy that was kidnapped right. and said, I was left alone. Now, I know for a fact Elizabeth was never left alone. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I heard that she had actually gone up to a woman one time and said, I'm Elizabeth Smart. And this was, woman was the only woman in America that didn't know she was missing. So, and then when she, you know, the Las Vegas police let them go, she had to be heartbroken, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, why didn't she try harder to get away? Because the identity that was uh, indoctrinated into her was totally dependent. There was no ability to reality test. It, when you're in a mind control cult, you're not allowed to think negative thoughts. You're told it's Satan or it's evil spirits. You're not allowed to imagine an alternate reality other than being with the group and, and the she leader. could have been very scared I mean here's a guy that kidnapped her from her own bedroom at knife point Absolutely. who probably said all along the way I can kill you if you do anything or I can go back in your house and get your nine-year-old sister or whatever and I'm and sure he pun physically abused Terry probably physically abused Wanda his wife who oh, yeah. was also probably well, a I, model of abuse I love what Jody said Jody said in a way, she's a hero. She did what she had to do to survive. Absolutely. Okay? <laughs> now, what did you do to help Terry? First of all, the family contacted me, and I do a preparation with the family to teach them about mind control, to teach them. The last thing you want to do is attack the group directly because it brings up all of the thought stopping and all the phobias. What you want to do is create rapport and trust, uh, talk about other situations that are cult mind control. Describe control of behavior, information, thoughts, emotions. Undo the phobias. I have a three-step uh, phobia uh, cure that I've developed as well. And eventually get the person into an environment where I can meet with them, with typically former members of that group or a, a similar group, where we can have access and begin to help them to start reality testing again. I got to tell you, looking at her sitting there with her mom, holding hands, after all that this mom has been through and all the abuse and brainwashing she's been through, I got to say you did a heck of a job. Thank you. Okay. The New Age trappings of the Heaven's Gate cult may strike some of us as bizarre, but cults or new religious groups are on the rise, and many have found a way to recruit new members on the Internet. Joining me now to talk about the cult phenomena online, Steve Hassan. Did I pronounce that right? Hassan. Hassan. Everyone's been mispronouncing it, All but right. a thanks former, for asking. He's a former cult member who is currently a licensed mental health counselor and founder of something called the Resource Center for Freedom of the mind. Also the author of a critically acclaimed book, Co Combating Cult Mind Control. He joins us here in the studio. Mark Kellner joins us from our NBC News Bureau in Los Angeles, writes the weekly On Computers column for the Washington Times. Welcome, Mark. He's also the author of the book, God on the Internet, a guide to spiritual resources online. And Jim Piccarello is a computer consultant who used to be a cult member. He joins us this afternoon from Boston. And Mark, if you wouldn't mind, I'm going to let Jim and Steve uh, tell us a little story first because uh, Jim got himself in some cult that Steve got him out of. So uh, let's, let's go through that first. Jim, uh, what was the cult you were in? As I understand it, it was a uh, computer cult, is that right? That's right. Um, that's right, John. It was actually a quasi-Buddhism and computer cult uh, run by a guy self-proclaimed as Rama, or as the media looks at him, Zen Master Rama. And uh, it started off um, real simple as just me looking into learning how to meditate by joining a meditation club at college, um, UMass Dartmouth. And um, eventually came to be where I was worship worshiping a guy as, uh, you know, worshiping Rama as an incarnation of Vishnu, the Hindu deity, and giving him all my money and spending all my time on his projects and uh, not being able to take a look at my situation critically at all. Jim, uh, if uh, Steve and your family had not come and fetched you from this cult, got you out of it, mm -hmm. uh, wh wh where, where would you be now? What's going on with this cult? Um, right now, as far as I know, I would be in Westchester uh, County, somewhere in New York, and um, I would not be communicating with my friends and family. That was my plan. Um, I was in for about a year, but at six months I determined that I was going to save money to move to New York with the cult and um, 
and not communicate with anyone who I'd ever known before other than people in the cult. Well, of course, uh, Jim, if uh, <clears throat> the cult members are watching MSNBC, they're invited to call 1-888-MSNBC-USA, and they can talk to you about your decision right okay. here on the air. But in the meantime, Steve Hassan, uh, you, you got them out. You, you are now a, do you call yourself a deprogrammer? De no, I don't, because uh, that's come to be associated with forcible intervention, illegal intervention. Kidnapping. And what, I'm a therapist, and I work with uh, Jim's family, and I really uh, take little credit in terms of fetching him. I really just helped his family to communicate with him and was able to locate a former member who knew him and spoke with him. And so at the point that we met to do the intervention, um, I think the key point for Jim was uh, the fact that, that he had been programmed hypnotically to see a gold light emanating from around Fred Lenz. And at the point that we had met and he had said this was the key, the key thing that made him convinced that he was enlightened, I explained it was really just a hallucination, a hypnotic hallucination, and told him it was easily reproducible. And he said, prove it. And I basically said, did something with him. And he saw the light around me. And he said, yep, that's it. I'm out. <laughs> Let me get my friends out. And Jim has been terrific going public. Because most people who are involved with cults, frankly, are embarrassed to admit that they were uh, you know, naive and taken advantage of and, and hypno hypnotized and programmed. Steve, can I make an observation about sure. Jim? He doesn't seem like a very good candidate for a mind control cult. Do I look like a good candidate for a mind control Well, no, cult? frankly, okay, you don't either. I, I mean, I, it just looks like Jim um, uh, is, uh, while he may have been drawn into it, um, didn't offer any resistance to the good sense of his family or you, whoever talked to him. Uh, oh, he did, except that his family was coached on how to approach someone. For example, when you're in a mind-controlled cult, you're not allowed to think negative thoughts about your leader or your group. And so when families try to confront and say, you're following a cult leader or something like that, automatically members do thought stopping. They shut down the negative thought. In his cult, they would meditate to get rid of the negativity. Um, and what I teach families is to learn about other cults and have a conversation with the cult member, not about their group, but about other groups, and make parallels in terms of control of behavior, control of information, control of thinking and feelings, and then ask questions of how their group is different than. And I use the Moonies, because that was a group that I was involved with, and they're very well known as a destructive cult, um, as an example of that kind of control. Right. And it's very effective. Tonight. Like the 39 who killed themselves, there are many more who give up their possessions, their families, even their lives. Every day you, you hope this is the day you're going to get news from her, a letter, a telephone call, and it never comes. Why do people sacrifice so much? He took away my identity. And what kind of person becomes a follower? Idealistic and usually a little naive. A little naive? With the latest on the Heaven's Gate cult, John Hockenberry explores the minds of the faithful on the fringe. Most people don't um, realize that nobody joins a cult. Cults recruit people. Steve Hassan says he was recruited by the Unification Church, which vehemently denies it's a cult. Today, Hassan is a counselor and cult critic who says that whatever you might think, Cults aren't really looking for wackos. Destructive cults are looking for very effective, productive people. As a generalization, they have uh, higher than average intelligence, uh, typically very creative, very um, idealistic, and usually a little naive. A little naive? Yeah. Maybe a lot naive. Maybe a lot. Cult therapist Steve Hassan says he understands all too well what happened in San Diego. So if somebody in this organization had said, here, you're going to eat this bowl of pudding and pills and put a plastic bag over your head and put this, uh, you know, purple towel over your face, you would have said, yes, Father? Yes. I was trained to do exactly what I was told on cue every single time without doubt. Which is undoubtedly why last week's methodical three-day suicide of 39 people went off smoothly and without a hitch. We know our daughter, the one we had, would never have done this but the daughter that he had of ours that he created in three years. She went right along with it. Watch as Dr. Phil goes inside a cult. Dozens of young girls brainwashed. Forced to marry old men and bear as many children as possible. And could the cops be covering it up?
They're protecting the criminals. This is statutory rape, endangerment of a child. This is against the law. Now, two brides have escaped, but can Dr. Phil keep them from going back? We believe that by leaving there, you will burn for eternity. I'm really going to go to hell. Steve Hassan is a world-renowned cult expert. He himself was recruited into a cult at 19 years of age. Now, he has written a book called Combating Cult Mind Control. Now, he knows the girls face a hard road getting adjusted to the world outside. So let me welcome you to the show, Steve. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Steve, what's going on here? People can be systematically broken down indoctrinated through controlling information, controlling their behavior, controlling their thoughts, controlling their emotions, and made into obedient, dependent slaves or clones of the cult leader. And the more authoritarian the structure of the group and the less contact people have with the outside world where there are checks and balances and normality, the more extreme behaviors can come about. We've seen this with uh, David Koresh, We've seen this with Jim Jones in, in, in Jonestown, many other cult gurus. And so there are tons of people like Greg, like Flora, who run away from the, uh, an environment like that. But uh, a huge problem is that they, they don't have anyone to turn to. Uh, many people in the mental health profession are not trained on how to counsel people involved with destructive mind control cults. Leaving there is one thing but having nothing or nowhere to go as far as a value base and, and, a, and a group to fit in with it is a big challenge as well. Raised in a cult. That's what's coming up right now. I want to talk. Please welcome the author of the book, Releasing the Bonds, Empowering People to Think for Themselves, Mr. Steve Hassan. Welcome to the show. You know, in general, you know of what this cult is right here, correct? You've heard of them. Oh, I, I absolutely have. I've been talking and helping people for about 30 years uh, in this particular group. Well, how many people in this group who have gotten out committed suicide in the last couple of years that you know of? I've been personally to two funerals. Don's been to two funerals. And in in this year alone, we have a list of 33 names um, who are, they were all under 30, and they have died in the last... 10 years, 10 to 13 years, um, all survivors. Some of them uh, died from uh, drug overdoses that were uh, caused from substance abuse problems they developed as a result of, of what they suffered. How do you help people stay out? Well, you know? first of all, Montel, I was in a cult, too. So I'm, a, I'm, I'm the fifth uh, that you mentioned today. I was in the Moonies for two and a half years in the mid-70s dropped out of college, quit my job, donated my bank account. And over the years, I've watched the bodies at Jonestown. I've watched the bodies at, at uh, Heaven's Gate. Uh, I've watched the planes go into the World Trade Center. And I know the mindset. I understand it very well. And basically, in my path, I, I was rescued by my family. And I've gone on to be trained as a licensed mental health counselor. And I've been helping people to heal from the trauma from the torture, from the brainwashing, from the mind control. And the good news is there is hope. Uh, the bad news is I've been doing this for 30 years. Mental health system is still not trained. People come in freaking out, and they're not asked simple questions. There are almost 15,000 or, or approximately 15,000 of these cults operating right now. It starts with the, f the friendly smile, how are you? Who are you? Where are you from? Or in this Tell case, the invitation yourself. for sex. In well, in their room. case, their parents got sucked in. Right. But in my experience, no one knowingly joins a group like this because this is basically a terrorist organization, a Absolutely. totalitarian, pyramid-structured group that uses deception and mind control and basically enslaves really wonderful people. The good side, the flip side, is the human spirit wants to be free. The human spirit wants love, truth, compassion. And it's the people who have these moments where they're hooking up with an aunt or a grandmother that says, come to me. But then they have a door to get out. Is that what you got? A family member? Came again? No, I'm, I, I, I can't tell you how many people have suffered 
and we live in 2005, and this still is an issue of epidemic proportions. Well, the world was shocked when it learned of the mass suicide in Jonestown, Guyana, ordered by cult leader, the Reverend Jim Jones. The impact of this tragedy demonstrated the destructive power that cults can create. Cults are usually defined by their total control over a member. Our next guest is well aware of the mind control that cult leaders can possess. Steve Hassan was a member of the Unification Church, a group better known as Moonies. He was deprogrammed after a car accident, enabled his parents to find him. Since 1979, he has counseled members who want to leave their cults. Steve describes his experience as a cult member and as a counselor in combating cult mind control. Also joining us, clinical social worker Arnold Markowitz. He is director of the Cult Hotline and Clinic, which is run by the Jewish Board of Family and Children's Services. Welcome to both of you. Steve, we don't hear very much about cults today, and frankly, I think that many of us, and I include myself, have thought that this is something that has gone away or has not had the current impact that we had seen in the past. Are we misguided? Uh, I think so. I, I'm, I'm in the field, so I see all of the, uh, the major uh, print media and television media and radio media on cults, and the problem is that cults are in an epidemic level right now since the 10th year, since the Jonestown phenomenon. We have political cults, educational cults, psychotherapy cults, and religious cults. And uh, mental health professionals need to learn more about this problem. Well, are you changing the definition? In a way, I need to have you expand on that. It was my sense that cults were uh, very closely knit groups becoming the extension of the family, pulling people totally away from the entire environment that they had had before, often making them labor for free. Now, the things yeah, you've already said may have changed the view of what we would call a cult. Yes. My criteria, as many of my colleagues in the field, is a behavioral criteria. We look at an authoritarian, pyramid-like structure with some charismatic leader at the top, deceptive recruiting techniques, and also mind control techniques like phobia indoctrination, information control, hypnosis, and thought-stopping type techniques. So this can be applied, these techniques, in combination in a variety of different contexts. And it really doesn't matter what the particular beliefs of the group are. They can be used for commercial ventures. It could be used for political ventures. But the bottom line is people are not able to think critically or to think objectively about what it is that they're involved with. And, they, and, they're, and they're made to have irrational fears that if they ever leave the affiliation with the organization, that terrible things will happen to them. They'll go insane. They'll be kicked killed by a car, they'll develop AIDS, something like that. How would you know if you're entering a belief system that's a part of your own design, or if somehow someone is invading and starting to shape and change the way you think, and the matter of will seems to just disappear? Well, I think the critical issue is to develop a consumer mentality, to ask a lot of questions and to be very wary of any environment that, that in the beginning encourages you to ask questions, but after you get involved, teaches you not to ask anything uh, critical or to read information that's critical of the group or to talk with former members and such. And so I advise people in my book, for example, to ask questions like, what is your group? Are you trying to recruit me? What is expected of me after I join? Is this group considered to be controversial? What is your attitude towards former members? Uh, these types of questions can begin to cut through some of the layers of deceit that the more destructive cults use. I also want to emphasize that these groups are pyramid-like in their structure. So when you're coming in from the bottom, you're only given as much information as the leadership thinks that you're ready to swallow. And so for the vast majority, for example, of people in TM who are just taught a basic meditation technique, I have no problem with meditation. It's where you get sucked into the next level and the next level where you're not meditating for 15 minutes in the morning and afternoon, but four hours in the morning and four hours in the afternoon, and you're devoting your life to Maharishi and becoming celibate and vegetarian. That's when it becomes more cultic.